Welcome to History at the OK Corral. Don't forget to subscribe, hit the like button, leave us a comment down below, and share this episode with a fellow history lover. And now, on to tonight's episode. Cojila, Mexico, December 1840. In the shallow, chilly water of the Rio Grande, a large group of Comanche warriors guide their horses from the northern banks in Texas to the southern banks in Mexico, intent on wreaking havoc upon the small settlements that dot northern Mexico. Though the name Comanche is enough to strike terror in the hearts of nearly every settler in the newly won state of Texas, their reputation extends far beyond the international border delineated by the Rio Grande. For centuries now, far longer than their Texan counterparts, the Spanish and then Mexican citizens who made their way north into the Chihuahuan Desert and then past the Rio Grande and onto the stepped plains of the Llano Estacado had been subject to the horrific reality of Comanche raiding. Stories of Comanche brutality had been passed on like family heirlooms from survivors, with accounts of ferocious murders and merciless assaults, with countless women and children taken prisoner, most never to be seen again. Although a workable peace deal had been agreed to and abided by between the Mexican settlers and the Comanche in the late 1700s, it had slowly but surely dissolved, and by the 1830s, settlements all around northern Mexico, including what is now the state of Texas, were once again subject to incessant raiding from not only the Comanche, but their longtime allies in the Kiowa, as well as other tribes such as the Navajo and the Apache. But it is the Comanche, whose name conjures up the most visceral images of terror and trepidation in the minds of the Mexican citizens inhabiting the very southernmost reaches of Comanche territory. Now, awash in the stinging chill of the biting north wind, the small settlements and long-established cities that line the Rio Sabinas, a tributary of the Rio Grande, fall victim to this Comanche raiding party, who systematically sweeps through town after town, mowing their way southward with ruthless abandon. San Juan de Sabinas, Soledad, Peroteran, Abayos, and countless other small settlements all cut a strikingly similar scene in the wake of Comanche attack. Their rooftops lit on fire, the ground littered with carcasses of livestock and bodies of men, women, and children, and a bone-chilling silence in the absence of the prisoners that had been taken. In the state capital of Saltillo, nearly 200 miles from the Mexico-Texas border, panic begins to sweep the streets as reports of Comanche atrocities flood in from ranches and haciendas nearer and nearer to the city. Only days before, the vast majority of the city of Saltillo's inhabitants would have considered the likelihood of the Comanche venturing so far south as to pose a threat to their city to be an absurd hypothetical situation. Now, with every day passing, the possibility seems more and more likely that the Comanche are on their way towards the sizable, centuries-old city. Still, the vast majority of the citizens who call Saltillo home are far more worried about the daily upkeep of their crops and livestock than with the seemingly remote possibility of the Comanche having the audacity to strike a city so far away from their homelands while being so wildly outnumbered. However, as the Comanche raiding party cuts their way through Zacatecas and then overruns the city of San Luis de Pelosi, the grip of fear becomes stronger and stronger upon the residents of Saltillo. It has been over a century since San Luis de Pelosi had seen the sight of attacking Comanches. But now, it seems to many of the devoutly religious settlers and citizens that hell itself has been unleashed upon them. However, it is thought that the Comanche's next target will be the wealthy hacienda of San Francisco de los Patos, roughly 25 miles west of the city of Saltillo. With this presumption in mind, both professional soldiers and militiamen are marshaled from Saltillo and its surrounding towns in order to assist in defending the wealthier town from attack. A scant few defenders are left to oversee the security of the city of Saltillo, all under the command of Don Jose Maria Goribar. Goribar is a prominent citizen and longtime local resident who has served as a former governor of the state of Coahuila and now acts as the magistrate of the Superior Justice Tribunal. Due both to an enticing target in its wealthier neighbor and an imposing size and population, it is thought amongst Mexican military officials that Saltillo itself is still under little actual threat of assault from Comanche forces. After all, it is reasoned, an attack by the horsebound Comanche on such an entrenched position against such an overwhelmingly larger population of Mexican defenders is far less likely than those same Comanche plundering the far wealthier San Francisco de Plato. 
Though this is a perfectly rational assumption, Don Jose Maria Goribar and his small group of resolute but decidedly semi-professional defenders are horrified to see the Comanche raiding party charging towards their city. With little time to spare, the small force takes to their horses and rides out of the city in order to meet the oncoming Comanche. Most among them find themselves nearly nauseated at the prospect of their near certain death, until a seemingly miraculous turn in the action takes place. Before the two parties reach within rifle range of each other, the Comanche stop their ponies in their tracks, turn, and begin to retreat back down the very same path from which they have come. Seeing this fortuitous break, the advancing Mexican force becomes more self-assured in their capabilities. Under the command of Don Jose Maria Goribar, the men dismount and set up a firing line on which to block the road into Saltillo. However, in the brief interim between dismounting and assembling themselves into a defensive formation, the Mexican settlers and militiamen are met with what must be a blood-curdling sight. The Comanche, once retreating only moments before, have now reversed course and are barreling down upon their dismounted foe with the intent of killing them all to a man. The Mexican forces now scramble for their horses, sprinting towards their mounts in a tragically futile attempt to outrun the oncoming Comanche ponies. In mere moments, before they can reach their horses and make their escape, Don Jose Maria Goribar and every one of his men are cut down by Comanche arrows and lances, then summarily stripped of their valuables, mutilated, and left to rot on the side of the road in Saltillo. The city of Saltillo itself now sits undefended, and a veil of terror and violence descend upon the city as the Comanche sweep through it, killing and plundering without discrimination. The Comanche, already laden down with the spoils of their previous raiding, now seem more bent on killing rather than accumulating more livestock, material goods, and prisoners. While nearly 2,000 horses are taken, nearly 1,100 cows, goats, sheep, and pigs are slaughtered and left to rot where they fall. The streets of Saltillo are soon awash in blood as the Comanche make their way from home to home, carrying off any women or children deemed to be good prisoners and killing the rest, until they finally grow bored and continue on their egress northwards to the border, now laden down with even more goods and prisoners. In total, 26 women and children are taken from Saltillo, destined for hard lives as captives and slaves. Behind them are left the bodies of over 100 of their fellow countrymen, many of them cut down inside of their homes. For their part, the Comanche raiders are now so encumbered by their loot that their movement northward is a rather tedious march, herding what is now a sizable group of thousands of horses. They are also so secure in their martial prowess and so intent on enjoying the spoils of their conquest that the party is slow to leave the city limits upon deciding to finally conclude their raiding. Meanwhile, reinforcements from the city of Parra de la Fuente are rushing towards Saltillo with the hopes of at least defending the survivors and driving off the Comanche. Upon their arrival, these reinforcements join forces with another small impromptu militia force that has been raised from the survivors of Saltillo. Before the Comanche are able to fully exit the city, they find themselves on the brunt end of an attack from the newly assembled soldiers and militiamen, intent on recapturing their loved ones and livestock and killing as many of the Comanche as possible. Caught off guard and now far less mobile, the Comanche flee the vicinity, but only after losing nine of their own warriors and 3,000 head of horses and mules, as well as 11 of their newly gotten captives. The Mexican forces from Saltillo now pursue the Comanche for weeks as they lumbered northwards towards the Rio Grande. Finally, as the Comanche are readying their sizable contingent to cross the river, they are set upon by the men from Saltillo and again, brutally caught off guard. The vast majority of the Comanche's livestock and prisoners are recaptured and many more Comanche warriors killed before they are finally able to make their escape across the Rio Grande. Though the raid upon Saltillo would certainly prove to be a seminal, traumatizing event in the lives of those who had survived it, it is by no means unique nor inexplicable. As author Brian DeLay notes in his work War of a Thousand Deserts, Indian Raids in the U.S.-Mexican War, it was the Comanche who in fact held political, military, and economic dominance over the area encompassing modern-day Kansas to northern Mexico. Their Spartan-esque society left little opportunity for young men to advance themselves socially, economically, 
or politically outside of raiding, hunting, and warfare. Thus, the raids like those wrought upon the people of Saltillo and its surrounding areas served as multi-purpose endeavors to simultaneously build the fortunes and further the reputations of young Comanche men with little to no opportunity to do so elsewhere, as well as to instill a highly useful sense of terror and dread in the peoples who inhabited the lands the Comanche considered to be their own. Whether these peoples were Texans, Mexicans, or rival tribes made little difference to the Comanche themselves. However, the constant pressure exerted upon both Texas and Mexico not only inexorably shaped the domestic policies of both, it was also cause for considerable discontent and disagreement between the two nations in regards to addressing the problem of Comanche raiding. In the ongoing land war for Texas that encompassed the 1820s and 30s, the Comanche held more sway than any of their rivals, a nearly unthinkable feat for a tribe who only a few centuries before had been relegated to the bottom rung of the tribal hierarchy in their original homelands of the northern Rockies. However, the coming decades would see the Comanche upended by wave after wave of infectious diseases in the form of cholera and smallpox, maladies their native immune systems were often ill-prepared to deal with. By some estimations, nearly half of some tribal bands would perish in a near-apocalyptic scene which saw many sick and dying Comanches left behind by their families who could find no other solution but to leave their loved ones and flee for their own lives from this unseeable evil. By the 1880s, the Comanche would find themselves relegated to the reservation system in Oklahoma. Once the proud and fearsome lord of the southern plains, they would spend the remainder of the century and much of the next attempting to rebuild from the devastating effects of endless warfare and disease. Saltillo would go on to rebuild after the Comanche attack only to find itself caught in the midst of the Mexican-American War six years later. Though their stories are often overlooked in the greater scope of the history of the Old West, the citizens of Mexico who settled the areas just south of today's U.S.-Mexico border suffered under some of the most consistent and violent raiding ever wrought by the Comanche upon their enemies. However, the countless tales of entire towns burned to the ground, entire fortunes being lost, and entire families being either killed or taken prisoner are too numerous to mention here in one episode with due diligence and respect. For tonight, those are other stories for other times. Thank you for joining us on this episode of History at the OK Corral. Be sure to click the like button, share this episode with a friend, and become a subscriber. And also, if you'd like to support our work and gain early access to episodes as well as ad-free viewing, you can become a member of this channel by clicking on the join button or click the link in the description below to become a member on Patreon. Thank you again for watching, and we'll see you next time on History at the OK Corral, home of history's greatest shootouts and showdowns.